thanks for filling the room for our California guests. We ordered up a little weather for you. It's been like this most of the winter. <laughs> um, you know, when, when, when you project ahead, say, decades, and we look back on this period that we're living in right now, I would say the obvious things that would come to mind would be the financial crisis. Certainly that'll be written about. Uh, the Great Recession, and we don't know exactly where we are in that cycle, but there is a, a recession that hit us. <clears throat> the less obvious thing, I think, when you look back, say, 30 years forward, is the technology revolution that's underway right now. Uh, it's dramatic, and it sometimes gets overshadowed by these other factors, but <clears throat> I can tell you my opinion, it's, um, it's a big deal. We all know uh, various statistics, 42% of the world's population is on the internet today. 2.8 billion mobile devices, that's a big number against the world's population. What's more dramatic is it grew 800 million just last year. According to Ericsson, by 2020, 90% <clears throat> of the world's population over six years old will have a cell phone. So some of those are projections, some of those are real. The internet of everything is real. It's underway, as Randy mentioned, it's creating new business opportunities, it's disrupting old business opportunities. We don't have to think beyond Amazon, um, Zipcar, um, uh, Uber, another favorite of my kids, to see how technology is redefining the world that we live in today. I suspect, and maybe I should say I hope for you, that as you think about your business, technology is in your top three strategic priorities, because if you're not thinking about how to use technology to enable something, to protect yourself from being disabled or disrupted, then you're probably missing the boat at some level. Um, <clears throat> we're thrilled today to have uh, a technology CEO who has spent the last three decades as CEO of three different companies. Mark Hurd, who is our special guest today, is currently the CEO of Oracle. You've certainly heard of Oracle. And then before that, he was chairman and CEO of, of Hewlett Packard. And before that, following a 25-year career with NCR, he became the CEO. So he's been the CEO of three major technology companies over the course of this 30-year period. And he has been at the forefront of innovation. He's also been at the forefront, for those of you who are in, uh, that are CEOs, of value creation. If you look at the value created across those three companies, during the time that Mark was the CEO, it's pretty remarkable, all up and to the right. Uh, Mark is a graduate of uh, Baylor University, where he attended on a tennis scholarship. He was the number one uh, ranked player during his years there. He still finds the time to uh, play a little tennis every week. Um, he also, as I dug into, you know, there weren't, there weren't a deep list of fun facts around Mark, but I do know. <laughs> That's probably a good thing, Mark, that I can't find that in wik Wikipedia. Uh, I do know he gets up early in the morning, so I get up early in the morning too, but four o'clock in the morning is a new standard for me. Uh, if you were to ask his staff about Mark, he would say he's a two-speed guy, uh, fast and faster. So um, without further ado, I'd like to ask you to join me with a nice warm Boston welcome for Mark Hurd. All right, hi. Is this working okay? All right, great. Maybe I'll stand down here. I thought about what to talk to you all about uh, today, because obviously you guys are you know, deep in a lot of subjects, and I got recommended maybe I could talk to you a little bit about database technology and how table joins go and how we can speed those up. I'm sure it's on all your minds. I'm not going to do that. Uh, to Jay's point about my background at, uh, at Baylor, I thought I'd talk to you about Baylor's uh, athletic program. Um, which we're very proud of, I am, but I won't do that either. So I thought, and I was also coached to get to Q&A just as fast as I could, which is hard for me, because I, I can't really even give my name and address in less than 20 minutes, but I will, I will attempt to be quick. But I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what Jay started with, sort of the technology industry, how we see it, uh, some of the things that affect our industry uh, over the years, and try to tell you how 
we think that affects going going future. The you know everybody knows I'm sure here because we're at an educational institute. Worldwide GDP is anybody know Randy? You know worldwide GDP? Okay, there we go. No, that, it'll work for me anyway. It's very good. So 77 trillion or so, and our industry, the IT industry outside of telecom, is really only a couple of trillion dollars. So it's really pretty small. It's three percent of worldwide GDP, and it's changed dramatically over the past 10 years. So it was only a trillion three, I say only, um, not nearly as much money as you manage. <laughs> so a trillion three not a decade ago, and that trillion three was about $850 billion spent by companies, and only a $250 million or $250 billion spent by consumers. So companies spending four times almost as much as the consumer. So what do you think's happened now? The consumer spends almost a trillion, and companies spend about 900 billion. So the, co the consumer now spends more than companies. This is a real, I'll try to connect this for you a second, but this is a real problem. It's a real problem, because it's not the only thing going on that the consumer has innovated faster than companies have. Companies take the trillion dollars, roughly, a little less than a trillion, that they spend, and they spend 82% of that trillion dollars just keeping things going, just cutting, cutting bills, uh, being able to process orders, you know, et cetera, because as to Jay's point, all of us that are run companies, we have to close the books, and, and if we don't, Bill, I'm sure you'll appreciate that, we get, you know, I get fired, right? I don't perform, I'm gone. So if somebody can tell me that, you know, I've got this noble thought process about how I'm gonna deal with all sorts of cool things over the next 10 years, one thing really on my mind is just, you know, getting through the year getting through the quarter, and my ability to take a time out to reinvest in all new technology infrastructure is really hard, really hard. So IT is growing, consumer IT is growing at about a 26, 27% CAGR, and companies are growing at two or three. So those are the facts as we sit today. The other problem that we have is it sort of sits here, I, I'm proud to say that we recruit a lot of kids out of college, and we recruit, I just made sure I had the data, Amanda, we're going to recruit 40 kids from BC this year. Yeah, so we'll recruit, just to give you some context of how we think about things. Yeah. I, I, I didn't do that for cheap applause. Uh, this is part of a broader strategy of ours. We recruit 1,300 kids off the college campus per year. And it's a big, big number. Our industry has historically been a mercenary industry. Mercenary in the context of, think of all the big companies, I won't name them all. Um, but they all have a bunch of people. And I always use the context to our folks that everybody's sort of bad people go in the middle of the table. And then everybody hires everybody else's people with the strategy that they'll be better for me. And it very rarely works. Much better strategy if you can build your own. You interview somebody for three hours, what are the chances of them being successful? Pretty, pretty, pretty low versus you have them with you for two, three, four, five years, what's the chance of that person being successful? Much higher. So we've gone back to the college campus. This brings with it another set of issues. The kids we hire are different from like me. They think different, they work different, and all the data says they're different. And this is gonna affect all of us as we sell to them and as we have them as employees. I mean, data that strikes me, I don't know how it affects you all in your companies, but first thing when you look, talk to kids today, data. 15,000 college kids survey, I more value flexibility in pay than the amount of pay. My reaction to that is, you know, what? I mean, what? I, I'm in a, I mean, I'm a kid, I'm gonna, I grew up in New York City, I grew up, I want to make more money. Flexibility in work, this is the first generation that has answered the question the way I just described. Motivated very differently than I was. The same time, you've got these same kids that say they want flexibility and pay that say they don't plan to stay with a company for three years. This is bad news for me because I'm hiring a lot of kids off the college campus. I'm going to invest in them and train them and then they're going to leave me. And as, as, as Jay mentioned, you've been with State Street, what, 31 years? I was with NCR 25 years. I told Jay earlier, at my 25th anniversary, I was CEO of the company, I got a plate. I got a plate. And I have, uh, I don't know if you all have a plate, but I have a plate. And in my office, in my office at home, there's a plate, and it says to Mark Hurd, you know, 25 years at NCR, and I'm proud of the plate. 
And, you know, my daughter, I have daughters that are, you know, college age and just out. They, I don't think they see much value in the plate. And I, I have a... I have, a, I have a lady who works for me who runs part of our, our, one of our regions, worked at IBM 30 years before she came to Oracle. She got a necklace. We talk about the plate and the necklace. These were important things. Not now. Different generation. They buy differently. They work differently. All of you know the stats. 43% of Americans can retire in the next seven to eight years. Many of us in the room are on the list. America has very positive demographics, as many people coming into the workforce. By the way, whatever you hear about America, problem with the workforce, not true. Many people coming into the workforce as leaving. One of the most favorable set of demographics in the world. But the problem being that the retirement age is now extending, and there is many people coming in that are 22 and 23. I tell you all these stories because the workforce is going to change. The buyer is going to change. The customer is going to change. The patience of the customer is going to change. I gave you a bunch of employee data. If I gave you the customer data, it's just as startling. I will not wait for service. Not only will I not, not only am I less loyal, but I'm very willing to tell people about your crummy service. I am willing to go on to Yelp. I'm willing to go on to TripAdvisor. I'm willing to go on to Glassdoor.com and talk about what a crummy company this is to work in. That is very different than when I grew up. When I got bad service, I'd call, I won't mention any company, I would call somebody and I'd yell at them, I'm good at it. And they'd send me a coupon or, you know, something. I mean, yeah, you get a coupon. And you get a, you get a discount on something or they send you a free drink coupon if you're on a plane and you go away. Now I put it on Facebook, now I tweet it, and you've lost control of that relationship. All of these changes in social media and mobility, to Jay's point, are huge. Now, just to give you one more piece of data, and then I'll, I'll stop talking, and we'll do as many questions as anybody would like. The average application, so think of the world in, in IT. If you looked at IT, that $900 billion, about $250 billion of it is to buy applications, or build applications, use applications, right? That average age of an application is 21 years old order processing application, call center application, all these applications, 21 years old. So I don't know, math, so Peter Lynch here, he's good at math. 21, 21 from 2015, what is it, is that like, I think it's, so, <laughs> it's very good. It's just tough when you have a witty audience, right? You know, they don't, they don't participate at the level you'd like. So I think that I needed a better straight person. This is 1994. So I think about, think about an application built in 1994. Pre, pre-search, pre-mobile, uh, pre-social, pre-historic. I mean, pre, pre sort of everything, right? There's nothing, right? So now you're going to try and make those applications work in the environment I described. This highly mobile, highly social, very collaborative, very interactive, employees that want to work in groups. I tell my kid, you know, I'm going to send you an email. So he's like, what's an email? And I don't do email. Who does email? I'm like, I do email. I'm cool. I mean, I'm in the new generation of tech guys, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't translate. All these create his huge, huge problems with really no money to sort of change it. This 2 3% growth CAGR in corporate IT ain't going to get it done. And that's why you hear all of this. You know, in our industry, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, in our industry, particularly where I'm from, which is the Silicon Valley, we tend to invent words every few years that will solve all of these problems. And they're, they're usually quick words. And right now, the most popular word is, anybody know? Cloud. Whatever your problem is, any of this stuff I just talked about, cloud. I don't, it, it, it's, gonna, it's, it's amazing the miracles that cloud is going to perform. But it is a popular word for a simple reason. It is a huge, huge secular shift of work being done by huge IT staffs being shifted into the R&D of the technology industry. If you learn nothing out of any, by the way, probably nothing out of anything I'll say, it's that the big promise of cloud is simple. Get somebody, it is fundamentally software over the internet and somebody else doing the work. And that shift of work from companies' P&Ls 
to the R&D of the technology industry, because our industry has grown up, if you drove down 101, if you ever drive 101 from San Francisco Airport to, to, to San Jose, it's littered with technology companies. And I mean literally littered. And it's literally littered with technology companies that sell a piece part. And that piece part is designed to be sold to you, and then you figure it out. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, I don't buy a car that way. I don't get electricity that way. I flip a switch, I want the electricity to work. I don't buy a pedal and a muffler and put it together, or have Accenture put it together in my driveway. Uh, I buy a car. I'm sorry, yeah, I know you'd like to put it together, but I don't want to do that. I want to buy a car. And so this is the way our industry is headed which is to make it simpler. And then to speed up as part of that simplification, speed up innovation. When you used to buy an application, the applications I'm talking about, you got a CD. You got transferred the CD, I handed it to you. You now own the CD. You would hand the CD to some third party, they might modify the CD. The only way you got innovation was the continued modification of a new CD that took two or three years to get delivered. This set of applications in the quote unquote cloud now probably gives you two, three releases a year of new features, all on our bill, not yours. And that's at the core of what this cloud is. It's a shift in complexity from, from companies to the R&D of the industry and a acceleration of features and innovation. And I, the reason I think it's such a core issue is I don't know any other way to get out of this trap that the industry has sort of worked itself into. And this has taken 30 years to get here. 30 years to get here. And these systems are so complex, so monolithic. And the ability to take a time out to go deal with these new set of dynamics in today's activist investor, I'm nothing against activists. Well, maybe I do, but I'm not going to bring it up now. So, that said, in this sort of environment, it's, it's just not a, 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 a rational outcome to think companies can take a time out to do all this work. So the industry's got to help do it, meaning our industry, to help do it for companies. And that's our mission. That's our mission at Oracle. But frankly, it's even the broader mission, I think, of, of that broader IT industry. The IT industry, by the way, if you don't know, um, the IT industry as a whole is uh, roughly, roughly speaking, going to spend in the neighborhood of $100 billion of R&D. So when you take that innovation that I talked about, you've got $100 billion. That's R&D of the enterprise companies. So that R&D becomes critical to getting out of this trap as opposed to just building discrete piece parts. So that's what I thought I'd talk about as opposed to... I could have taken you through Oracle and all that, but I thought I'd rather address sort of these broader issues that we've got. I'd love to take any questions anybody's got about, about anything. Hey, Bob. Sure, sure, I'll repeat the question, sure. Cybersecurity, yeah, I mean, how, how will it affect the environment? I think it'll slow it down. And I think, you know, you've got this, some of these uh, concerns are real. Some of these are, 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 are not. Uh, most, remember, most attacks, and you, you use the term cybersecurity, but most attacks are, are not from China uh, or Russia or some, 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 some nation state. Most attacks are from within your four walls. So I think the last data I've seen is 92, 93% of attacks come from inside the four walls of the company. So the issue of security in the broader sense, I think, is a major, a major, a major issue. The perceived context that somehow moving your data to the quote unquote, whatever you want to call this thing, the cloud, somehow increases your security risk, I think is almost nonsense. The fact that a company can secure in its four walls data. By the way, regulators, who are some of my best friends, you know, will tell, they think the world is physical. That, hey, tell me that data is on that computer, on that floor, in these four walls. Gosh, I feel good. That has nothing to do with reality. That's not how information technology works. Data is fundamentally virtual. 
and the context that all of you have in the metadata data that's outside your firewall is way beyond whatever you think. Now that said, the ability for somebody like us or I can name others who can secure that data is materially higher than any individual company. Now I think you'll see a lot of innovation in this area. Um, we'll wind up encrypting all the data in our cloud. Historically, you wouldn't encrypt. Encrypting being, you know, you'll, you'll actually you know, take the data and you won't be able to recognize the data. The people running the Oracle Cloud won't have your data. They'll have encrypted files. That key will be with you, not with me. So if the, even if the Department of Justice called me up, I, I was telling Jay this earlier, said, hey, send me Bob's data. I'd, you know, first I'd say no. If they showed up with a, with a subpoena, uh, I, I'd hand them over a bunch of encrypted files. And good luck to you, because my guys are better than their guys. So, so now, now, I think as you see VPN and you see these private networks evolve, you'll wind up with encrypted files over private networks. And these will be highly secure networks in, in highly secure encrypted environments. And now, that's going to be different than if you just go to a consumer company. So there's a very big difference between an enterprise company and a consumer company. I mean, consumer company is not going to encrypt consumer files. But, but big enterprise technology companies are going to go this direction. So I think we'll be good. Most of the hacks, and I'll stop on this subject on this, this cybersecurity, but most of the hacks you've seen publicized come in through the ones that have come from nation states have come through very weak or, or poorly secured peripheral systems. When you go into a department store, you're going in through a point of sale solution. Why did you go through a point of sale solution? Because the retailers, in the name of performance, download the credit card files to the store level. And in the case of one big retailer, that's how they got the credit card information. So there's all of these have a story, Bob, all of these have a story behind it. And if, you can, if we can do as an industry the job of sort of demystifying all this, I think we'll, we'll over the years, we'll, we'll, we'll make some advancements here. Yep. Thanks, Bob. Hi. Hello. You're going to have to get behind the pole to see me, or me behind see you. <laughs> you want me to get I'm away over from here. the pole? Wait a minute. I'll right, come I'm over coming, here. I'm coming this okay. way. That's all right. <laughs> yes. Diane Durkin with Loyalty Factor, and I, I have a two-part question. Oh, no. I this know. is like my conference calls after a quarter. I have one it's question, true. but I've got eight parts. <laughs> I promise I won't give it to okay. the press. Thank you. Uh, um, you mentioned you're going to hire 1,300 people uh, from the colleges. Yes. All right. Yes. What is your turnover rate? on those groups, <laughs> and what is your retention strategy? Because that's a very expensive yes. proposition. Yes. Well, that was it. That's it? Well, that's good. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what you say is a, is a, is a, is a big deal, right? We recruit uh, all these kids, and we put them into an environment, and frankly, we start by just training them. So we spend three months just really nurturing them, teaching them about products, about processes, about people, and frankly, part of that is also building a network in the company. I mean, just to give you an example, I have all these kids, when they get out of school, come to my house. And I actually do that because, well, not because I want them at my house, really, but because I want them to feel some bond to the company, and I want them to meet all the executives they otherwise, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't meet. Our retention to be very, let me be open with you about Boston, because we have four big hubs in the United States, Boston, up in Burlington, uh, Austin, rest in Virginia, well, let me say Austin again, Austin, Texas, and then Redwood Shores, which is where, where, where I live. First, from a recruiting perspective, it's hard to get people to come to Boston. It's not the easiest place to recruit to. Everybody on the West Coast wants to work on the West Coast. Many people on the East Coast want to move to the West Coast. I have very good luck in Texas getting the Texas kids to go to Austin. Austin is cool. Austin's hot. I can recruit to Austin easily. Now, the flip side of that is the attrition rates are very different on physical location. Attrition rates in Austin are not high. Attrition rates in Boston are not high. Attrition rates in Redwood Shores are extremely high. So when you recruit a kid, a kid's making fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 out of college and can make some commission if they're a salesperson or may make 75, 80, 85 if they're an engineer. The fact is you can go down that 101 pike that I described and just take a different exit and get $20,000 more the next day. So this, it, it, it's hard. So being in, being in the Silicon Valley has its benefits. On the attraction side, it's got its downside. And because I'm the guy investing in training, and, and all these little companies, I'm not going to go after them right now, but I'd like to, is, is to say, listen, I'm, I'm not here to be your you know, training arm. And so I'm, 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 I'm thinking all sorts of 
neat, cool ideas where I maybe do something different. Uh, but, but your point's the right one. I mean, we try to give these people advancement. We, it's, the biggest relationship you know, a kid has in, a, in, a, in any company is not with the company, it's with their manager. So remember, it's all about, it's all about the relationship. They see Oracle not through what I say, but what's what their, man, their, their whole lens to Oracle is through their manager. So our biggest lever is to get the managers to be able to mentor, train, coach, and develop people. So that's what we work with. Hi. Hi. <clears throat> what is the next new word, the next big thing after the cloud? After the cloud. Wow, there's a whole bunch of, you're going to hear two things. One thing that's already got a name and one thing that's going to get a name. So there's this whole thing called Internet of Things. Have you heard this, this crazy thing? Internet of Things. So this is where you put a bunch of cool technology. I think of it's like Java, which is on the phones. And it's going to start showing up in, quote, unquote, things. Things are defined as, you know, uh, forming hydration systems, cars, uh, all sorts of things that can now hook to the Internet. And it's going to bring with it a whole other term that you're going to love, big data. And if you ask me what big data is, that would take a little time that I have left. So big data is, think of it as nothing more, in my opinion, than just lots of data. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I could give you a lot, you know, I could list you all this nonsense these people talk about, but it's really just a waste of your time. It's really just a, a software on a bunch of devices kicking out a lot of information. And it's really granular information. And most of the effort is to go through data that it is probably 95% worthless, but looking for a simple pearl that could make a difference. For example, if you put that, like uh, National Oil Well Varco, you know, they, they put 10,000 Java sensors on an oil rig. And they're simply monitoring everything that's working. It's kicking it back to a network operations center sort of every two, three seconds. Almost all that data says everything's fine. Totally worthless. But if you found that drill bit before it broke at the bottom of the Gulf, you saved $20 billion. The technology is now going to give you the capability in an economic way to go chase that level of atomic data. And that's going to be the Internet of Things. Second big thing I think you're going to see is a big change in this, uh, I don't have my phone with me, but user interfaces. So I think by the time five, ten years go by, this thing where you're sitting on a device and you're sitting here with your finger, you know, punching, I think they're going to think we're just nuts. And so the next generation is going to get a whole new capability from an optical perspective, a voice perspective, in the way that you be able to get at information. I think you see it today a little bit in consumer. You'll see it in spades and companies with the ability to now go cross application. Today, most data comes out of a siloed application. The ability now with a sort of ubiquitous user interface, your user interface of choice, to get at any information you want. So I think you'll see cloud, Internet of Things, a huge change to the UI coming. Uh, that will, frankly, change the way we live and work. Okay, sure. Anybody I've ever? Hi. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Joanne Simons from Cardinal Cushing Centers, and I'm Hi. thrilled to hear all this talk about employing young people. Um, and wondered whether or not Oracle had a uh, diversity policy that included um, young people hiring with disabilities. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I, I was, I, I did an interview with the San Francisco Chronicle a couple weeks ago, and they were all on me on, on diversity. And I'll tell you. Let me give you a, a, a view on this. If you're in the Silicon Valley, it's a really big deal to advertise you know, your philanthropy, to advertise your diversity. We, we don't. We actually do it. And there's a big difference between the two, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little sensitive to the point because we've chosen not to advertise, like for example, our chairman, um, who's, uh, uh, I think everybody knows his name, Larry Ellison, is, is probably, <laughs> Uh, and he's, he's a very shy guy and doesn't <laughs> tend to get out in the public much. Uh, State Street, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the one client that Jay has at State Street, <laughs> and he drives 92% of that 33 trade. But anyway, he's, uh, but, but Larry is, a, is actually, for all of the, it's actually a little hard for me to talk about. He is one of the most thoughtful men you'd ever meet. One of the most generous, philanthropic men you would ever meet. You know how many buildings he's put his name on? Zero. Zero. And this guy donates more money than I, and I, I actually know, and I think part of it is he, he's got the image that he's got, um, but, and that's what the company does. You know, we, we sort of tap, have the personality of our founder. We're a, a very generous company, but we do it without a lot of fanfare. Same way, the way I, 
look at ver diversity, maybe is a little different. I think about it not just from the way some people write about it, but more from what our workforce has to, has to look like our customer and has to look like the market. And, and frankly, we hire that way. If you look at engine, we're a very, we have 136,000 employees. We'll do, we do business right now in 84 separate countries. We happen to be very Bay Area centric. We have 18,000 employees in the Bay Area, but it's very important for us to look like our customer. And 56% of the business we sell this now doesn't, is not in the United States. So we debt, but we don't, the one thing we don't do <laughs> is we don't legislate it. We drive it through leadership. I have a, my partner at Oracle is a woman who is arguably, I'd say, not arguably, maybe the best executive in the technology sector, including me. And we lead by example. I mean, that's what we try to do, not lead by numbers. But so policy-wise, we tended to have less policies and more focus on what we do. I've not been called sir in a long time. It's really good. I was with investors this morning. None of them call me sir. Sorry. Uh, the Pete Pfeiffer and McGladry. Uh, three major companies, CEO. How would you compare or describe the innovative process of your leadership team that you're a part of different than the other two? Not any better or worse, but just how do you approach it differently from the innovative thought process? Yeah, you know, I, and I get questions like that a lot. I mean, all these companies are different, right? All these companies have different DNAs. They've got different market positions. As a, re as a reflection of that, they have different strategies um, in the market. I mean, Oracle is a very, very technology-centric uh, company. And by, by the way, it takes on the person of our founder, who was a programmer, but I mean, wrote a database. And so when you, when you were to talk to Larry, you'd be talking to somebody who thinks about the context of innovation and what's the next great product. Now, innovation just doesn't come in product and technology. It comes in business models. It comes in approaches to new markets. It comes in risk-taking, et cetera. All of these are different forms of innovation. And I think in, in, in Oracle, you found with a founder who typically thinks in 10-year increments, very different from, you know, to be very blunt with you, a hired-hand CEO. Hired-hand CEOs, which by definition is most of us, you know, we're, we're, we're a babysitter. No, I'm, a, I, I'm full, fully cognizant. I am a babysitter. And, and at some point in time, if I'm not as good a babysitter, we'll get a new babysitter. And so my, my, my job at the end of the day is to help drive. I think that's right, don't you think? I think that's right. I mean, it, you know, it, it, I, I don't say it really to be funny. It's just the truth. I mean, our job is to move these businesses as fast as we possibly can. My job is to move this company ahead, take market share, grow revenue, grow earnings, satisfy customers, and do that so more customers want to do business with Oracle. And that we can do that through adding value the way I described to help them leapfrog today's problem to tomorrow's opportunity. That's our job. And if I can't do it, the next guy will. Now, each company has its own DNA that you have to change to be able to capture that opportunity. And I hate to compare the three, because in their own right, they're all three great companies all with different challenges and different opportunities. Maybe we'll put it that way. Yeah, thank you. Let me see if there's anything, anybody over here. Sure, please, yeah. Hi, Nick. So I, um, my company's taken on some venture capital and I'd love to get your thoughts on you know, what the kind of impression is from your standpoint on venture capital and the notion of a bubble and the valuations out there that's sort of kind of going on, and in the tech sector in general. Well, because I, I, I'm on the buying side most of the time, I think the valuation, I'm sure you find the shocking are too high. <laughs> and, and, and I find in M&A, it's almost, it's, a, it's a sort of uncanny that everybody I run into, their uh, view of the value of their company is higher than my view of the value of their company. And, and I think right now what, what's hot in the market is really somebody that can help address one of those three problems that I, or opportunities that I described. Cloud is very hot now. There are really very few cloud. Just to be clear, there are three different discrete businesses in the cloud. There is what's going to be called platform as a service. That's, that's a different business from infrastructure as a service, which is different from applications as a service. All three of those had different competitors, different competencies, different opportunities. If you're in the applications as a service market, you are typically extremely hot right now. 
Now, that can be automating any process that you automate, because really, all applications are, every company's got, well, most companies have a strategy. Uh, then they have a business model to support the strategy. Then they have processes to support the business model. And applications fundamentally automate the processes. The more sticky the process is that that application is automating, the higher the valuation. So if you build a, a SaaS application that's merely a portal so that, that Bob's company can now hook up a bunch of different funds on a portal that you can see, that's interesting. But if you really are automating a process like order management or billing or something like that, your valuation is going to be materially higher than a company that's building a portal. So it really depends on the depth of the process you're automating. Those valuations are just silly. They're silly. They can be, you know, 10 to 1, 11 to 1 revenue. By the way, if you want a real thrill, go out and look up the valuation of like Salesforce.com. Salesforce.com earnings. I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm on my best behavior uh, over here, over there. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I, I've told there were some press people in the room, so I, I should be very careful to say this. But I, I, this is just a fact. Their earnings, the, the reason they, they have a very high earnings ratio, because they don't make any money. <laughs> I, I, I find this as interesting to the kid that doesn't want to make more money and wants more flexibility in job. They make no money. I mean, how do you do that? And the cash flow, there's no cash flow. So when you look for a cash flow, it says a cash flow, <laughs> for a cash flow multiple, and it says N-A. And, they, and they're worth, what are they worth right now? Is anybody, uh, 35 billion? Yeah, it's just, who cares, right? It's just silly, right? It's just silly. So, but, but, they're quote unquote, cool. Thank you, thank you so much, Bob. And we have, <laughs> we're, we're, and, 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 and people ask me for real numbers. Like they say, what's your cash flow multiple? Shit, I mean, I gotta really, I gotta have real cash flow. I mean, earnings. I mean, hey, we're worth, I don't know, we're probably worth, what are we worth, like $190 billion right now, 188 something like that. And, and we have to do it with, like, you know, real numbers. <laughs> it's crazy out there. It's crazy. It's just crazy. It makes no sense. If you want to make a lot of money, automate a very sticky process, do it through a SaaS application built on a scalable platform, you're a very, you're a very hot company. Anything else for me? Hi. I'm coming. Yeah, uh, I've got a quick question. Um, sure. But first, thank you for speaking. Uh, I'm here with the BCMBA with a few of my fellow students. Um, you spoke before about making uh, the cloud driving simplicity and accessibility. Yes. Uh, I know at Oracle you have to sell to a pretty diverse, uh, you know, slate of companies. How do you balance uh, making sure that it's useful for those companies with making it accessible to everybody at the same time? So it's a very, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think that useful is a very interesting word um, because part of the problem with I'll, I'll stick on applications for a second. That's a more, you know, specialized product automated to discrete process. It's it's very important that companies take ownership to these problems as well. Historically, the way the market has worked is that we would come in with a standard set of of. of things that would automate a process, and the company typically would sit there, big companies, particularly like the ones I run, and say, eh, that's not exactly how we do it. And we'd actually like the software to adapt to our processes. And so somebody then for modifies the software to adhere to the processes the company has. The downstream impact of that set of decisions is huge. So the ability, it's a team sport is my only point here. As we get to the innovation of being able to add features dynamically, and it's a very different world. You're going to get lots of features now coming in the new applications as part of your subscription in the cloud at, as opposed to the way the old model was with that CD. But really working to keep your processes standard. As if you're going out in an MBA and you're going to become a leader of a company, try really hard to stay as simple with these processes as you can because that's going to benefit not just you but generations of leaders from time to come. Many of these applications you find are so, uh, I'll use the term, bastardized that you can't fix them. They were made up by a bunch, and most, most leaders in most companies, it's changing now because of the new generation, but most leaders have no, no, no idea of the implication of these changes that they're making. 
And so it really takes CEOs and COOs and presidents and CFO, whoever's at that table that's making those core decisions to make sure they're really cognizant of these things they do when they do it and keep it as standard, as simple as they can. You know, simple is the best. If you wanted any operating advice, I would always say keep things as simple as you can and gosh, things get better for you. Anything else? Yes, yes, sir. Driving products, did you say? Profit. Profit. Well, United States is a good country. Um, <laughs> I, I, I like the United States. I mean, I think, I think, listen, there's a lot of different uh, things going on around the world right now that are very complicated. And, and we, you know, we have to deal with those. I mean, you've got a certain set of things that have occurred in, for a country like Venezuela, for example. Very complicated. Currency situation in Argentina, very complicated. You've got a, a big economy in Latin America and Brazil that's now in recession. You have a, a country in China that is now not growing as fast as it is and has now put regulation. So for example, if you go to China right now, they have started a process where they have communicated to the state-owned bank, or the banks that, are, they're all fundamentally state-owned, that say, that actually dictate to them where they can buy technology. Imagine that. You will buy PCs, by the way, we don't sell PCs, but you will buy PCs from companies based in China. So we're now gonna legislate to you, not only what you're buying, but where you can buy it from. So all of these countries have a little different set of dynamics. I mean, it's hard to argue that the country that has the most uh, stable economy right now, in spite of everything you hear on TV, is, is, is right here. I mean, Europe has taken the long, I mean, the, I, you have people here at this table know far more than I do about it. So I can tell you that in, in Europe, what we see is a very slow growth uh, environment. And, and we've invested a lot, so we've done something different. We've grown in Europe, we've, I get questions all the time, we've grown 10, 11% in Europe in a market that's been flat to negative one, negative two in IT. And it's simply because we put more salespeople in Europe, not because we see the economy being any better. This country has been, been actually uh, quite stable, and, and, and I would say if you look at pipeline and people looking at opportunities, it's a pretty, pretty active economy here relative to what's, what's around the globe. Anything else? Yeah, one more, sure. I Our biggest competitor? Uh, well, let me start with, let me tell you who they're not. So they're not like, there's a German company that uh, had, had built applications a long time ago, and, and, and I can't remember their name, they got letters, and, and they're sort of, I think they've done nothing. I think they've done absolutely nothing. In fact, they made an announcement the other day saying they had the biggest announcement they had in 23 years because they were gonna now take their applications, not rewrite them, but host them in a data center. And my reaction to that was the fact that's the biggest announcement you've had in 23 years is the core of your problem. So, sorry, this is my idea of fun. Uh, so, <laughs> I would say today on different levels, our competitors would be in the application space. If we were looking to buy an HR application, we'd probably compete with a company called Workday. You might never have heard of them. Uh, but as the cloud moves to ERP, which is your core financials, manufacturing, supply chain, those sorts of systems, I think it will move from being what was SAP to companies like that, or maybe even company yet you haven't, you haven't heard of. We've been the first mover in that space, and they haven't followed. Salesforce.com is a competitor. I make fun of them for a, a reason. Um, <laughs> and then when you have like, uh, IBM has sort of historically been a big competitor to Oracle. Uh, not as much today. IBM has moved to a services-led uh, model, so they're almost more partner to us than they are competitor to us. They would compete with us in a few er er infrastructure areas, but so our competitors change depending on which part of our, you know, we have 82, 83 product areas we compete, and we have a little different competitor in each application area and a few different competitors in the infrastructure area. We are the only real tech company that's sort of end to end. I Meaning you get from us a computer, an operating system, a database, you know, sort of the tools that manage that and applications, and we can do it for you in the cloud or on premise. So therefore, we have a lot of different piece part competitors. But our objective at the end, listen, you can know, I'll give you the numbers again. We have 6% market share of the total IT market. So nothing. And we have 450,000 customers. We can't get, we can't double our company by getting 450,000 more customers because we've got the biggest customers. So the only way we can do it is sell twice as much to the customers we really, we really have. And so we wind up with multiple competitors along the way as we go.
What do I think of Microsoft? I think of them like the, uh, no, I think, uh, I, we'll end on this one. Uh, yeah, so I think on Microsoft, I think, uh, I think they have done a good job. Is my, is my fundamental, when I see what Microsoft is doing, they're trying to fundamentally move their on-premise business to the cloud. And it makes, it makes incredible sense to me what they're doing. So what, there are many companies, I gave you examples, SAP, I read their strategy, and I'm being very, very, very transparent. With you. I don't get it. I think they've made a huge strategic mistake not rewriting their applications for the SaaS uh, market. Microsoft, I completely understand what they're doing. Now, whether they'll do it or not, or whether you like them, that's a whole different debate. But strategically, when you listen to where Satya says he wants to take the company, uh, and they're a lot like us. They've got a very technical founder. They've got uh, many similarities to, 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 to Oracle. I, I read what Microsoft says, and, and, and I get it. They also have a platform very similar to Oracle. Ours is better. But they have a platform very similar to Oracle, and they'll be very active in that as well. So I think Microsoft's a good company. I think it's a well-run company, and I think they have a strategy that makes, makes sense. It's going to be all about execution for them as well as it is for, uh, for us. Okay, well done. Thank you.